All right, I see slide one. That's perfect. I can't see slide one, but um, okay. So welcome to to this webinar on monitoring economic activity using light and light imagery, innovation over the last ten years. So I'm Kenneth Mbeyi. I'm a researcher at uh, at the French National Research Institute for Sustainable Development, and I used to work at IFD with my co-host Claire Zamuzo. Uh, so Claire is the head of the Impact Evaluation Division at uh, at IFD. And uh, today we are we are really happy to have uh, Christopher Christopher Elvich from the Earth Observation Group, uh, and I actually had the pleasure to work with with Chris as part of a research project that we launched together in order to try to extend the DMSP series by including uh, New Year's starting from 2013 till 2021. Um, and uh, this uh, project basically came uh, came about because at IFD at, the, at that time we wanted basically to uh, to encourage our colleague to to use Netamnet imagery in order to help monitor the impact of different projects funded by IFD throughout the world. And it was actually quite limiting not to have uh, comparable data sets over a long time period. And Chris is actually going to, to tell us a lot about uh, the different Netamnet data set that exists, what are the differences, and uh, and what are the new products being uh, developed at, uh, at his uh, institute. But just before that, I will uh, take a few minutes with uh, Claire uh, to showcase a few, um, a few examples, or at least a few case studies of using Netamnet imagery as part of uh, helping either monitor or helping uh, put in place a dialogue with uh, uh, with uh, practitioners in the different countries where IFD is involved. So, Claire? Yes. You can explain how the platform works. Oh, yes. Oh, and how the platform works. You, you, have, you have a question part. So there is a, a part for question. Uh, just write to, to the chat button. So if you have any question during the presentation, please go go directly to the question uh, to the question part to ask your question. The advantage of basically asking your question in in the question part is that people can upvote your question, and those questions that are upvoted by a lot of people can actually uh, uh, come ahead. And on the chat, you can use the chat basically uh, to chat between. Uh, between yourself and and, so, and also to, to chat with us. So those are the, the, the rules for how this is going to, to play out. Uh, so before Chris' presentation, basically what Claire and I decided basically, or wanted basically to share with you are two case studies. Um, one case study was uh, about measuring the impact of typhoon on economic activities in Vietnam. This case study started as part of a dialogue that we opened up with uh, public officials in, in Vietnam in order basically to identify projects that are worth pursuing. And to do that, uh, one, one question that was of interest was basically to try to assess what is the impact of Typhoon and how does this impact vary uh, from one location to, to another in order basically to identify the places where uh, investment could be actually reallocated in order to uh, to help reduce the impact of, of typhoon, or at least to to help start a, a discussion about places which are vulnerable the most to to typhoon. And and Claire is, also, is actually going to tell you about another case study uh, that uh, that involves using that imagery. Claire. Yes. Yeah, so we use also. Um, satellital images and nighttime light imagery, not only for dialogue, but also for the project appraisal or for monitoring um, some projects. And the case study I will just uh, show you now is one evaluation. So what is interesting, it's that using uh, nighttime light imagery, it allows us uh, to make some project evaluation at the end of the project, even if um, we have not anticipated 
to, to monitor some indicators uh, before the project. So it's the case um, of for a project in Dakar on street lighting and capacity building project for the mun municipality of Dakar. And the idea was to monitor the street lighting after the project. So based on an analysis on a series of night light, night, uh, nighttime light imagery, um, we were able to, to demonstrate that the project has um, a strong impact on the street lighting. And uh, we were able to, to follow this indicator on the areas where the project um, was, were implemented, but also on other areas. And um, the results of the analysis was that the street lighting was much less in the areas where there is no the project and it was much bigger well, uh, in the areas where the project was implement, implemented. Um, it was the same for the growth of the street lighting for both area. So the correlation was very important and it helped us to have not a perfect impact evaluation, but at least a proxy of the impact of this project. Uh, this is very interesting because for in our, we have at AFD more and more territorial projects with geodata um, information. So it's a very interesting path for us in terms of uh, monitor more and better our, our impact in the project and uh, to implement more impact evaluation based on satellital images and nighttime light uh, data. So these was, were just like two examples, and we are very keen to know more about uh, the night, night time light imagery availability um, and the, the new uses uh, that Christopher, you know. So that's why I'm going to let you the floor now. And after that, uh, we will have the pleasure to have a discussion by our research director, Thomas Melonio. Um, so after the Christopher, you have 45 minutes max for your presentation. And then Thomas, I will let you the floor for around 10, 15 minutes of discussion, let's say with Christopher. Christopher, the floor is yours. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, great. So, uh, thanks so much for the opportunity to talk to you. Um, and this is an area of activity that I started in 1994 and uh, initially as a federal employee at NOAA, National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. And in 2019, I retired from NOAA and moved my whole operation, including staff and algorithms, to Colorado School of Mines. And uh, so um, let's go on to the next slide. All right. Okay, so um, we've been uh, making these products for a long time, and they're they're quite popular. Uh, we post them for open access. Uh, people uh, don't uh, need to tell us what they're going to do with the data. There's no copyright, and uh, as a consequence, um, it is really boosted the number of citations that I have in the scientific literature. Plus, uh, we see our products in many unexpected places. And uh, so the most famous one is uh, an image of the world or part of the world with the lights, and it, it's instantaneously recognizable. And uh, every week I see it somewhere, uh, often several times. Um, now, our flagship product is what we call a cloud-free composite. So we screen out the clouds as best we can and make an average radiance or average brightness. However, uh, we 
came to realize that there's a certain amount of information that's lost in an average. And uh, so we developed a new style of product that has the nightly data that's filtered and adjusted as best we can for effects like view angle and lunar luminance. And there's a lot more information content there. And so I'll show you some examples. And uh, we have made um, uh, studies of some of the phenomena that may be of interest to your office. For instance, electrification. We have an algorithm that can recognize the presence of new lighting. And uh, we can uh, look at that over a whole area to uh, track the growth in lighting, the spread of lighting. And also uh, we've developed algorithms to recognize outages and recovery from outages and several indices that are useful for rating the reliability of electric power supplies. And uh, so um, in, in addition, we have a second product that works with uh, uh, infrared spectral bands at night, a total of nine of them. And with that, large number of spectral bands, we can calculate the temperature and uh, the source size for infrared emitters. And most of them are fires, biomass burning, but we can filter those out and get at the industrial infrared emitters. And we can categorize those and track them th through time. And so I, I see that there's been several, <clears throat> of several of your projects have already used this data and I'm hoping that uh, by describing some of the data on other projects, let's go on to the next slide. All right, so this shows the uh, time of day when the satellite overpasses occur. Uh, the original sensor that we use for this research was called uh, the operational line scan system flown on DMSP. DMSP is the US Air Force Meteorological Satellite Program, which started back in the 1970s. And uh, they added a low light imaging capability. Uh, they already had an infrared spectral band, which worked day or night and is quite useful for detection of clouds. And their meteorologists said that they'd like to be able to see clouds at night in the visible. And the engineering solution was to, uh, was light intensification. Uh, with enough intensification of the signal, it's possible to see clouds in the visible illuminated by moonlight. And one of the consequences of that is that it's also possible to see um, lights present at the Earth's surface. And <clears throat> For a long time, uh, there was no digital data. There was only film data. And in 1992, uh, a, a digital archive was established for DMSP at NOAA. And that's where I got my start. And we started from scratch writing the algorithms to make these products. So anyway, um, the usable nighttime data is in the, the center band of this diagram. And you can see a long series of satellites um, and they have this arching uh, track uh, indicating that the orbit was not fully stabilized. And so the orbit changed in a progression over time. Uh, and the time of the overpass is significant because there's diurnal changes in the brightness of lights. Now VIRS, the modern series, comes over between midnight and three o'clock in the morning. But our original DMSP was early evening, between eight and 10 o'clock at night. The extension series for DMSP is um, pre-dawn. And so uh, what happened is that there were some satellites that started out as daytime, nighttime, that one half of the orbit was day and the other half was night. And over time, those the orbital overpass shifted, and eventually those some of those satellites began to collect pre-dawn nighttime lights data that we can use. So now we've got a mix of uh, some early evening, some after midnight, and some pre-dawn. 
but uh, we can work through that and extract usable information uh, from all this data. Next slide. And this is what can help us build. Uh, this is a, a chart showing um, the years and the availability of products. And so it all starts down in the lower left-hand corner, 1992, and it ends in the upper right-hand corner with the recent years. And so the, the various columns are different satellites. And generally there's uh, some overlap between succeeding satellites. And so that's, that allows you to, to bridge uh, between satellites as you run up this ladder from the early days to the present. Next slide. And here's a zoom in looking at uh, some lights in India. Uh, in the lower left-hand corner is early evening, 1992. 1992, yeah. And there are very few lights. There's just a few. Uh, looking at the same area, uh, 11 years later, there's quite a few lights. That's the 2013. And uh, then as you move to the right, you're seeing uh, in the middle column, uh, Veers. And the right-hand column is the extension series of DMSP that was funded by AFD. And uh, so uh, you can see the progression in lights um, and also you can see diurnal effects. If you look at the uh, row in the middle, uh, it starts out with DMSP early evening and there are quite a few lights. If you look at the veers, there's still uh, quite a few lights, but some more gaps where there are no lights detected. And on the right-hand side, is pre-dawn DMSP, and uh, a lot of the lighting has been lost. Well, that's part of the story because the diurnal pattern changes uh, from region to region. There's some areas that uh, go almost entirely black uh, after midnight, and there are others that have a lot of lights. So having these over different overpass times, actually, there's information content there about the diurnal cycle of lights that uh, can be quite interesting. Next slide. All right, now this is an example of the nightly temporal profiles, where instead of making an average radiance for a month or a year, we report the uh, brightness or radiance of that spot on the ground over time. And so you can see there's a fast increase in the number of samples, uh, but having this style of data makes it possible to pinpoint the date when something changed. And uh, we'll see examples of this uh, further on in the presentation, but that's one of the benefits that instead of saying, well, the lights got a little bit dimmer uh, in, what, in a particular year, we, with the nightly data, you can see that, yeah, here's where the change happened. Uh, it actually, uh, there was an outage and uh, the outage lasted for 37 days, and then the lights started to recover. So there's a lot more information in these nightly temporal profiles, and we've assembled them. Um, it's not global yet, but uh, we've as assembled them for quite a few parts of the world. Next slide. And here's the map showing where we've assembled these nightly temporal profiles. And uh, so, uh, we have a capability to make these for any part of the world, and gradually we're uh, trying to expand the coverage. Next slide. Here's the example of the detection of electrification. And so on the left, you see the temporal profile starting back in 2012 and ending in 2021. And uh, we set the detection limit nominally at about one nanowatt. And so over time, in some places, you can see that the lighting gradually rises. And when it crosses that detection threshold, lighting detection threshold, we can say that electrification has occurred. Uh, and so this is a case where uh, you can actually see uh, when 
electrification occurred, and then uh, the lights just keep getting brighter. Uh, on the right-hand side is a animation, and it didn't activate. It's uh, uh, Ghana and a couple of neighboring countries, and the animation shows the expansion of lighting through time. And it's a really dramatic case because year by year, the lights, the area of lighting is getting bigger and bigger. And sorry, the uh, animation didn't activate here, but uh, I can send that to uh, anyone that's interested. Perhaps I'll send it to Ken. And he, uh, if you're interested to see that, uh, he'll, he'll be able to pass it on to you. Next slide. And here's an example of the loss of lighting. And in this case, this is in uh, Sana'a, which is the capital city of Yemen. And um, it was bombed, uh, aerial bombing, in March 2015. And so prior to 2015, you can see that the signal is bouncing around a lot, and there's evidence of annual cycling. And so this is a characteristic of an an area that uh, has electric power supply, it has lights, but the variability is quite high and that's associated with instability in uh, the power supply. And so just looking at it, I can say, yeah, this power supply is not very stable because uh, it's bouncing around, the radiance is bouncing around a lot. And it wouldn't do that if the electric power supply was stable. Now, when the aerial bombing occurred, uh, the lighting was uh, virtually extinguished. And so you can see that steep decline with, a, with the first arrow on the, on the left, March 2015. That's when the power went out. And uh, you can see a year after year that the lighting is slowly, very slowly coming back. And so you can actually uh, track that with a metric uh, percent recovery. The other interesting thing to note are the spikes. Uh, there, are, Each year there's a spike in the brightness of lights, and we've tracked that back to uh, the Ramadan uh, festival period. And uh, so uh, this is a, a case where, uh, although the lights went out, uh, we know that there are still people there because once a year uh, there's a spike in the brightness of lights. Oh, I see in, in the chat is the uh, animation that I wanted to show you guys of Ghana. Uh, and those yellow lights is, is the growth of light lighting. And so we're ba basically accumul accumulating the new lighting as yellow. And so year by year, step by step, you see the, the lighting expand. All right, next slide. And uh, here is an example of uh, a trend analysis. And this is very common, that over time, the lighting is getting brighter. And uh, so it's a characteristic that you can see in many parts of the world. Uh, the upper left-hand one is in India. The lower right-hand one is in uh, Yemen. And in the India case, you can see annual cycling. And we've uh, traced that annual cycling to uh, load shedding, which is an annual phenomena in uh, particularly in Northern India, where uh, during the hottest months of the year, the uh, brightness of the lights dips uh, because they are, uh, the power company is uh, cutting back on the voltage uh, due to the heavy demand, where the demand is outstripping the supply, and so they start to regulate the supply. But uh, despite that, you can see that there's an upward trend in the brightness of lights. The one, the lower one, uh, Marib, shows that lighting was quite dim, uh, generally under five nanowatts until 2017, and then the lighting, the brightness of lighting began to grow. And uh, there's also evidence of annual cycling uh, in Marib. Um, this, uh, you see the, the ramp, well, I was gonna show you, there's a, a red ramp uh, on the Marib temporal profile. 
Uh, it's of an index we call lift, where you begin to develop a gap between the lower, the, the dimmer lights and the noise floor. And so the noise floor is down around one nanowatt. And uh, in many parts of the world, you can see that there's a gap between the bottom end of the lighting brightness and the detection limit. And we call that lift. All right, next slide. This is a study we did of annual cycling in India. And we found uh, th three types of phenomena. There is uh, annual cycling with a, a single dip. Uh, we also found uh, uh, double dip cases. And then when there's no, when we can't detect annual cycling, we call it acyclic. And so we could divide the lights in India into these three categories. Acyclic, which is uh, green and is most common in the south. And then in the north, you can have either a single or double cycling. And uh, in the double cycling case, uh, one of our uh, project participants believes that's due to a, uh, a reliance on hydropower for electric power supplies. And that during, during summer months, there's a shortage of electricity uh, due to heavy use of, of air conditioning. But in the winter months, uh, when the power is being, has a heavy hydroelectric power as a source, there's, can also be a dip that's associated with a uh, low uh, flow rates at the uh, sites that are making the hydropower. All right, let's go on. Uh, and the other thing we've been looking at recently are statistical moments. So the statistics, the primary uh, the number, primary moment is the mean. Secondary moment is variance. The third one is skew, and the fourth one is kurtosis. So with these temporal profiles, we can calculate those moments and then look and see if there are any groupings uh, based on moments. And so you wouldn't be able to see this as if all you had was the, the mean. Uh, you can see variation in the mean, but when we add in variance, then we begin to see zonation. And so uh, on the left is a scattergram for uh, the mean. Uh, this is uh, on the y-axis and variance is on the x-axis. And this is using all the temporal profiles that we've made that have nightly data worldwide. And so it's, uh, if you, we made data for individual sites as well, but uh, when you pull all the data together, you begin to see zonation. And so there's an area that starts out near the origin and uh, increases in brightness, but does not uh, change a lot in variance. And so we call that the core lighting. Uh, there's an area, there's a spur uh, where the brightness of lighting is relatively low, but the variance is high. And uh, so we uh, called that the dark erratic zone in areas that have gas flares, but we can find it in some, some urban areas as well. Uh, there's a bright erratic zone where the lighting is quite bright and the variance is, is quite large. And then there's uh, a, a zone that we call bright and steady where uh, the lighting is unusually bright, but also quite steady. All right, so now I'm gonna show you examples of each of these or several of these at least. Okay, here's core lighting. And so this is from Phoenix, Arizona. And so you can see that the average brightness is about 50 nanowatts. And there's good evidence of lift. That is to say that there's a gap between the bottom of the data cloud and uh, the detection limit, which is down around one nanowatt. Uh, and so uh, you don't see a lot, you, you see the, the signal is bouncing up and down and that's just uh, the residual variance uh, that you find even when you have stable lighting. And uh, so there can be a number of factors that contribute to that. One is uh, alternating current 
induces flicker in some lights. And so no matter how you try to correct for view angle and atmospheric correction, you'll never get rid of that. It's, it's baked in. Uh, so uh, when you look at the, the histogram, uh, you see almost a, uh, a Gaussian shape. And uh, so this is kind of a, uh, an idealized example of core lighting. And uh, so we'll go on to the next slide and we'll see something a little different. All right, so here's a, a case that we call the dark erratic. And uh, so the signal is dropping frequently down to the noise floor. And then it, it is on, on occasion, it is quite bright. And so this is an example that's in a, uh, an area that has uh, oil wells with gas flares. And the gas flares are intermittent. And so when there's no gas flare active, uh, there's not enough lighting at this site to be detected by veers. And so the signal drops down to the noise floor. And you can see in the uh, histogram that there is a, a peak very close to the origin that's in the noise floor and then a long tail. And so you have high skew, high uh, kurtosis, high dispersion, and a relatively low mean. Next slide. Here's a, uh, a, an example of what we call the mid erratic. And so it's not as bright as the bright erratics, but it still has a lot of vari variance in the signal. And this is in Marib, and you can actually see there is annual cycling, but imprinted on top of that are uh, events. And uh, you can actually pick out the, uh, the lighting uh, dimmed substantially several times, but most prominently uh, when in 2015, when the area was uh, bombed by uh, Saudi Arabia. Uh, if you look at the histogram, you can see that uh, there's a, it has quite a bit of skew and there's a long tail. Uh, so uh, uh, you can see that the histogram looks different from any of those that we looked at in the previous few slides. Next slide. Oh, yeah. The other thing I would have mentioned about that is that in the recent years, you can see the lighting has recovered and perhaps surpassed its level in uh, pre, uh, prior to the bombing. Here's uh, an example of a bright erratic. It's in uh, Las Vegas, Nevada. And you can see that uh, the, the, the lights are extremely bright and there's extremely high variance. And uh, so there are, uh, uh, we, you can find this type of uh, behavior in many of the bright commercial areas in, uh, in cities around the world. All right, next slide. All right, this is another product line that we make. Um, it's the drive from our fire detection. And this uh, uh, makes it possible for uh, us to make a, a daily, nightly product that has the detections uh, around the world. And then we can uh, put them into a time series and characterize them based on their temperature and location. So in this case, uh, gas flares are the red balloons. And this is Nigeria, and so there's a lot of uh, gas flares active uh, in the uh, Niger Delta region and coastal areas, but also offshore. Uh, there are some refineries that are marked with yellow gas pumps. Uh, the thing that uh, uh, we found that was unusual here is that there's uh, another type of detection that uh, we have not yet labeled formally. Uh, those are the question marks. They're cooler than gas flares and they're not in areas where uh, there's a refinery. So we have a database that we downloaded from some, some other organization that has locations of refineries. And so if we find something that's the temperature of a gas flare and is 
co-located with one of these known refineries, we label it refinery. But uh, in this case, there are another, there's another type of uh, emitter that's a lower temperature than a gas flare or a refinery and uh, is mixed in with the gas flares. And we've traced this back to uh, what I'll call bootleg refineries. So it's organizations or groups of individuals that siphon off uh, oil, crude oil that has not yet been refined. Uh, they put it in some type of tank and uh, uh, put a fire under it. And uh, they are able to get some separation between the phases. So there's a, a tar-like phase. And then there's a phase that is comparable to diesel fuel. And so they take that, uh, that liquid fuel and resell it. And so it's a, a well-known phenomenon that occurs in Nigeria. And uh, we've actually found it and can uh, track these sites over time. Next slide. <clears throat> All right, so here is an example of a gas flare in Algeria that was extinguished. And uh, so this is one of the rare cases where a flare was, uh, flare disappeared. And so you can see in the upper pan is the mid-wave infrared radiance. In the mid panel is the temperature. And so it's up around uh, 1700 K, which is the temperature of a gas flare. And then in the lower uh, uh, temporal profile, you can see the flared gas volume. And so you can see this site was very active. Uh, it started out at a relatively low rate in 2012 and then it had a bump up. And uh, it, at just before it went out, it got quite, quite bright. Uh, and then there's a gap and then it came back briefly and then it went out again. And then there's one period of burst of activity in 2022. So it appears that the site is still active and perhaps they have uh, diverted the gas and they're doing something else with it um, instead of burning it. And so because we can still see it on occasion in 2022, including one burst of activity, uh, the implication is that, that the site didn't go away. They just began to do something different with the gas instead of burning it. And when they can't do that, they'll go back to burning it, but that doesn't happen too often. So this is uh, uh, how we can use this data source to track the gas flares of the world and to find the ones that have been extinguished, to find the new ones. And uh, it's relied, our service is relied upon by the World Bank and others to monitor global gas flaring. Next slide. And here is the, uh, if we take all the gas flares that we found in uh, Nigeria, we can make a, a monthly summary of how much heat was uh, put out by the gas flares and we can make a temporal profile. And so um, there is a, a, a prominent dip in several months uh, in 2020 that uh, may be related to uh, shutdowns associated with the outbreak of the COVID uh, pandemic. Uh, there's also evidence of a downward trend from 20, 2018 to the present. And so it, it is known that Nigeria is making a, a substantial effort to reduce gas flaring. And we can see that uh, there is evidence of a downward trend. Next slide. All right, now here's uh, the same type of chart, but looking at the uh, what I'm referring to as the bootleg refineries in Nigeria uh, that are labeled formally as unknown, but in this case, we believe what we, we, that we do know what they are. It starts out with a spike in uh, heat output in uh, 2012 and then there is a drop. It becomes relatively stable 
they actually go out in uh, the middle of 2014. Then they come back and they are present at a, a relatively low level. Then it starts to go up again in late 2016 into 2017, and then it goes down again. And then in, in recent time period, uh, it's been pretty active. And so uh, you can look at the individual sites or you can pull them together to look at uh, a whole country. And so uh, based on this, uh, it looks like uh, these sites have been active even in 2022. However, there are periods, and it may be an annual cycle. We haven't applied the annual cycling analysis here. Uh, but uh, there are periods of time when it drops substantially. All right, next slide. All right, so it looks like uh, uh, those are the slides that I had to share with you today. And if we have time, we can uh, have some questions and discussion. But uh, we have a time series of nighttime lights that goes back to 90, 1992. Uh, it involves multiple satellites, and uh, in years where multiple satellites are active, there are multiple products, and so you have sort of a crossovers to, to track that ladder from one satellite to the next. And this can be used to analyze, this, analyze changes in lighting at a local level and at national levels. Uh, there is more information content if you can uh, make the temporal profiles. And uh, then you can see when specific events occurred. And uh, you can also, uh, that's actually a, a more useful data set for detection of phenomena such as uh, electrification and outages. Uh, and we have those for quite a few places, but it's not anywhere near global yet. But we have the tools to make new ones when uh, there's a reason to. Uh, we've developed algorithms to uh, detect electrification, outages, recovery, growth rates, and cycling patterns. We have, we have a second product that focuses on infrared emitters, and uh, we now have a catalog of industrial infrared emitters around the world, that, uh, and we've produced temporal profiles for each of those emitters. And so we're just now uh, releasing that and uh, it looks like a very interesting way to track industrial activity through time. All right, next slide. That might be the last one, so let's see. Oh, okay, a list of recent publications. And uh, next slide. There is no next slide, Christopher. Oh, You're okay. done. <laughs> Good. I'm done. So, uh, anyway, uh, I'm happy to stay on and have discussion. And uh, I, I really appreciate the opportunity to speak with you today. Well, thank you. Thank you so much, Christopher, for not only taking the time, but uh, drawing this space odyssey that you took us over with together with you. So it's uh, with a few space oddities in the process as well. But you, I can see already a few questions. Uh, of people in the audience uh, who have questions for you. Maybe just a few comments uh, from AFD. And I'm not the biggest specialist of satellite imagery, but just to tell you where we are in terms of research and evaluation and why we were interested in having you in the first place. But you you raised many, many questions afterwards. So I will try to make sense of it if, if I manage to. So just, just to, to come back a little uh, to confirm to our audience, but also to you that AFD is quite interested in not only satellite imagery, but in its combination with algorithm. And you insisted upon this fact, but for, for a number of reasons, uh, as a development bank and agency, we feel that not only it's useful to provide with imagery, but also to invest in algorithm and algorithm training in the context of developing countries where imagery was expensive, a little less so today, but also algorithm in developing countries relatively scarce and sometimes expensive or not, really, not easily uh, at reach for, for, the, for governments. Um, that, that's a, just a first general comment. 
Um, second comment is that in the um, we are interested in imagery and algorithm in many aspects, but uh, whether and Claire mentioned it earlier, but for the before, the during, and the after uh, of financing phase. So typically, or what we call our technical divisions, when they uh, when they are actually solicited by by government to provide financing for a project or a public policy need to establish a baseline or, or sometimes to technically contribute uh, to the setting up of a project of public policy. Again, I want to state for our audience that the projects we found are not all projects, so we provide assistance uh, to governments, but, they don't, but governments in developing countries do not necessarily have access to imagery or algorithm related to questions that they're asking ourselves. So we're happy to provide with support or partners uh, in that particular field. And again, it can be during the period when we study a particular request for financing, it can be during the process if the particular public policy or project requires uh, imagery or, or algorithm, or it can be uh, as Claire and Kenneth uh, uh, are working on, but to evaluate the impact, the exposed, exposed impact of a particular public policy. Um, uh, you, you have treated many themes today, Chris, so um, maybe I will just name a few <laughs> here or there that we have a, a special interest in. Um, uh, Kenneth, uh, who is here, uh, worked on deforestation and uh, we, all, we too have an interest in rural development. Uh, and of course, you present maps of uh, lightning, but to a certain extent, it designs a, a map of the zones where there is no lightning. <laughs> so uh, when you will want to protect forest biodiversity or know where poverty might be, uh, of course, we are interested in not only knowing where wealth and GDP per capita is, but also where it is not. Uh, and uh, just to maybe to add a bit of more complexity in the process, but uh, of course, we are interested in zones where there is a light, night uh, lights, but also in the zones where there are not. It doesn't mean when there is apparently uh, no economic activity or population is access to electricity, that nothing is to be done. It's just a different a set of interpretation and maybe intervention that needs to be uh, uh, designed. The maybe more so, so maybe people in the audience will want to comment on uh, typically this uh, this interest for forest biodiversity and also rural development where uh, we have less um, government data and where uh, satellite imagery is uh, highly relevant. Uh, more often, and Claire talked about it earlier, but uh, certainly. Uh, the work that you do is very relevant when we want when we when we're helping to design transportation systems or help urban planning, um, monitor housing. Um, uh, that's more self-evident. So maybe I, I won't be uh, much longer. I was interested in the last part also in the potential use of uh, uh, nightlight analysis to monitor carbon emissions uh, related to oil and gas industry, for example. I had not seen that one coming, but <laughs> which is why uh, uh, I was happy to, to be part of the discussion today. Um, and as a tool probably to help uh, uh, either regulate oil and gas or detect, uh, um, detect uh, un, uh, unforeseen or unexpected uh, carbon emission due to oil and gas uh, industries. Uh, but I, I wanted to ask you if you had similar ideas also in the field of uh, CO2 emission measurement uh, with the, the use of, uh, um, of night lights to estimate uh, carbon emissions, whether in, country, in countries or region. Uh, I think that's also very potential, um, important use of, uh, of night lights. Currently, countries are declaring their aggregate CO2 emissions, but with little manners or possibilities to control or to um, to improve the measurement of such carbon emissions, which have become a global, uh, a global, uh, um, a global problem. So, so it's, it's just a few things that I, I wanted to to lay out or mention, maybe to have you react, uh, Christopher, uh, again stating the interest of AFD uh, or the instruction monitoring or evaluation of our project, and also you. Um, I mean, you, you, you raised the number of topics and certainly stimulated ideas of our audience. I, I can see already uh, quite a number of questions in the chat. Maybe I will uh, ask if Claire and Kenneth can uh, help and join in to maybe to, 
to name or, or mention the, the, the chat. Uh, Chris, Christopher, I don't know if you have a um, capacity to, to, to access the, the chat, but uh, if not, maybe Claire and Kenneth, you can help moderate the, the discussion. So ju just a few remarks here, Christopher, maybe you want to, to comment, uh, jump in, uh, if anything raises uh, <laughs> uh, ideas or feelings or whatever. <laughs> uh, yeah. You may okay. want to well, say. Uh, yeah, a couple of things. Uh, for, for gas flares, uh, we've got the premier data set on gas flares worldwide, where they are, what they're doing, and it's, it's widely utilized. Um, the, uh, and there are several organizations that are pushing to reduce gas flaring as uh, uh, perhaps as low-hanging fruit in our efforts to reduce uh, carbon emissions. And so if you can use that gas instead of flaring it, then it, it's, it offsets the use of other fuel types. And so there is a net reduction in uh, carbon emissions if the gas that's being flared gets utilized in some other way instead of just burned off into the atmosphere. Yeah, considering um, the warming, and, yeah, considering the warming form of methane in particular, reducing gas flares is very important and does have uh, short term and, and big scale impacts, which is why I saw that as an important yeah, uh, and, contribution. Yeah. Yeah, and so the primary gas that's being burned is methane, and uh, our the sensor we work with has no ability to detect uh, methane plumes. It's just when it's combusted that it gets detectable. Uh, however, there are other sensors that can actually see plumes of methane coming from uh, sites where had, there's a point source. Or and other sensors that can see at almost like a regional scale the uh, methane concentration in the atmosphere, and so there is a lot of methane emitted from the oil and gas industry, um, and there there are is an increasing number of of reports that when uh, flares go out, sometimes the operations shift from burning the methane to releasing it directly to the atmosphere. And yeah, of course, exactly. that's uh, a, a huge source of global warming because methane uh, uh, is, is a much more potent greenhouse gas than CO2. Uh, and one of the services that we're planning to start up this year is to uh, identify gaps in flaring uh, that uh, may indicate a shift from flaring to venting and make that available uh, so that the organizations that are using other sensors to detect methane plumes uh, and methane concentrations in the atmosphere have uh, another tip off as to where they might look to see, uh, to find a, a methane plume. Yeah, it's and what I had in so mind. You can compare the expected flares versus observed flares and probably by calculating the difference uh, uh, measuring methane emissions uh, in, in the cases where you know the production of gas, but so you know how I mean you know how much or how many flares you should observe, but uh, but by your real observation you can uh, probably calculate the difference and therefore the emissions related. Yeah. to it. Yeah. So uh, you know the way we build our temporal profiles, we have a uh, a, a long series of observations, and usually there's some. Um, Normal, normal condition where there's uh, flaring quite often and it's at a particular level. And uh, so if it suddenly drops out or uh, diminishes substantially, then that's a tip off that, well, something has changed. And uh, a, a growing number of uh, papers have been published by organizations that have worked with sensor data that can see methane plumes and uh, when a flare goes out, uh, that's frequently when uh, a, a plume of methane uh, develops. And so it's not universal, but it, it's, it, it is a nice tip off. Now about the modeling of generalized greenhouse gas emissions from fossil fuel consumption that's distributed over, across the landscape, um, our nighttime lights product, we don't do this ourselves, but because we uh, allow any organization to download the data. Uh, it is used by carbon modelers 
uh, to model the uh, spatial distribution of uh, carbon emissions, particularly CO2, uh, from fossil fuel consumption. And they, they do this, they're interested is in that because they have uh, sensors uh, that uh, are oftentimes on towers that monitor CO2 concentrations and several other gases. And they try and untangle the sources to uh, uh, track back to the carbon sinks and carbon sources and they, they, to do that in a thorough manner, they need to know what is the spatial distribution of the fossil fuel CO2 emissions. And so they use our lights as a proxy for uh, fossil fuel CO2 emissions. And so our job in that is to provide the nighttime lights data set. And uh, so there are quite a few papers that's, that cite us as a source for a nighttime lights data that ended up uh, being uh, used as a primary source in a carbon uh, source, carbon sink study. And maybe, uh, Chris, I was also interested in, uh, of course, the importance of your work to show the viability of electricity consumption, uh, in particular because it has consequences, of course, on electricity production, so as to, so that supply meets demand. Um, and of course, and, and, and by definition, the viability in consumption would generate difficulties on the production side, uh, which may lead to typically carbon emission or much higher prices when demand for electricity is uh, highly viable, whether intraday or intra-year. Um, and I, was in, I just wanted to ask you whether your work has been uh, directly used by electricity companies typically so that they can design their production capacities uh, in the short term, but also over a longer period. I'm saying so because we have lots of requests at AFD from governments willing typically to expand access to electricity, but also to decarbonize. And quite often, the capacity to regulate demand over the course of the day, the months, and the year will be crucial to design uh, electricity production. So I was wondering whether you had been aware of direct uh, use of your, your data and algorithm um, not only to monitor demand, but again, to structure uh, supply uh, in the, over the long term. Yeah, the, uh, the one organization that I'm aware of that uses this data for those types of applications is the World Bank. And um, uh, they, uh, their reporting is usually internal, so uh, they, don't, they do publish some papers, but uh, a lot of what they find is in their internal reports rather than uh, paper, papers where we can, uh, where everybody can read about it. But I, I know that they look at the nighttime lights uh, in areas where they've sponsored uh, projects to uh, build up the uh, power generation capacity. And they're asking the same questions about reliability. Uh, you know, I look at it as a, a way to, uh, assess what did we get for our money? We, we spend a lot of money uh, building power plants. Uh, can we see evidence that uh, it's getting distributed and utilized? And uh, one way to do that is with nighttime lights. So we're, we're, we're always in, interested to collaborate with others uh, and uh, uh, even produce specialized data sets when uh, there's a reason to. And so the, the, the specialized data set that we're, um, that seems to have a, a boost in the information content is the nightly temporal profiles. And so we've built those in a lot of places in the world where it, it would be uh, interesting to look at in terms of changes in the power supply and international investment in power generation. Um, and so we do have a, a, a nice, data set that others can look at, it's all open source. So um, um, if there are cities that, uh, or parts of the world where you guys have invested and you wanna take a look and see what has happened in terms of the nighttime lights, uh, let's talk about it. Oh, very interesting. Just, I wanted to also quote my my colleagues and friends, uh, Florent Makizak and Eddie Asumu, who jointly uh, did the work on Côte d'Ivoire. 
And one of the conclusions of the simulation of the electricity uh, electrical system in, in Côte d'Ivoire was that precisely storage would be needed uh, to so, so as to be able to uh, adjust the difference between supply and demand in the context where um, solar power is going to increase over time. So, but knowing, including during the night, the viability of uh, or the the, uh, the volume, of course, but also the viability of demand is uh, is hugely important. So, similar to the World Bank, we we because because of our contacts with uh, with governments, we we have such an interest. But I don't want to take too much time of the <laughs> uh, from the discussion. Maybe uh, Kenneth and Claire, you are probably. Uh, you have your right, your eyes right on the chat, so maybe there are questions you want to um, to to phrase or to name or to to give space to, so that Chris can answer answer them. I can that clear, maybe? Yes, thank you, Thomas, and thank you, Christopher. Um, first, there are lots of questions about uh, where to have access to these images and to the products you are you show and uh, if the images are free and so on. Um, so we put directly uh, in the question section and in the chat, um, the conversation, uh, the link where you can uh, download the database or the, um, or the paper uh, that uh, Christopher presented, uh, or the results. And uh, yes, uh, most of the images uh, used for those analysis are free and accessible. So just click on the link in the, um, in the question section and in the conversation. Yes, please, yeah. do you want to comment on that? I mean, maybe um, there are other products which are not, not currently free. freely available. And uh, if people were interested, for instance, I'm thinking of um, the um, of a VNL profile that uh, that that you just mentioned. So, if people are interested in getting access to the VNL profiles, for for which countries, for which cities are those, are those profiles available? Uh, where can they basically go to to have access to, to that? Uh, yeah. So, uh, you know, our flagship product are the uh, monthly and annual cloud-free yeah. composites, which are the average average brightness levels. And those are um, those are global. And we have somebody on staff that uh, that's their job is to keep up with the production. Um, and so there is a uh, if you go if you do a, a, a web search on Earth Observation Group, you'll probably stumble upon our link. And uh, there's a button there for DMSP and Beers Nighttime Lights. And so it sort of bifurcates as you track down and uh, eventually you'll get to the page where you can download those files. The nightly temporal profiles of nighttime lights, um, I included a map in uh, the presentation that shows where those sites are. And uh, there is a, a particular page uh, where all that data is uh, openly available. Uh, the, we have another fire, another product that's focused on the detection of lights offshore, and that's primarily fishing boats, but there are other uh, lighting features offshore that do get picked up. And uh, so that data has about a 45-day a lag between when it's produced and when it's open access. And that's because we have, we offer the near real time data as a subscription service. And, uh, you know, we're a soft money operation. Even my salary has to come from uh, money we bring in from external sources. And so one of the primary ways is through subscriptions. And it's always sort of a balancing act between, well, we want to, we want the scientific community have to have access, and uh, but we want to have some paid subscribers, and so we we have about a forty five delay, forty five day delay in the open access of the boat detections. Uh, we also make monthly and annual uh, summary grids of the boat detections, and uh, that data, particularly uh, we, when you add it up over multiple years. Uh, you can see a lot of structures 
uh, lighting structures offshore, and we're just starting to explore it. And one of the interesting features that we find are what are called anchorages that are located near ports. And when vessels are waiting to get into port, uh, they're often assigned to a location where they should go park. And uh, it's not obvious in a single night, but when you accumulate the data for years, you start to see these uh, rectangular features and other features uh, out in the water that are close to ports. And uh, they're, so we're, we're discovering features we never thought we'd be looking at uh, by uh, compositing our products over long periods of time. The uh, third product is the fires and flares. And um, we offer uh, researchers uh, at universities and nonprofit organizations with uh, uh, no cost subscriptions that can access all that data. And then we also have uh, sales of subscriptions to commercial entities. So uh, we've got in total three primary product lines. One is lights on land, one is lights offshore, and the third one are the third one is the our infrared emitters. And so, if anybody has questions, you can write to me, uh, and uh, you might keep Ken as a CC so he's aware of, of uh, what uh, uh, is coming from uh, your organization. But uh, yeah, I'm I'm happy to discuss the discuss the data sets and. Uh, how you might uh, consider using them and uh, the access issues if, if they do come up. Thanks, Chris. So uh, there, there was a question on um, to which extent the, the annual cycling that we see in night and light values can be driven by climatic factor, for instance, cloud coverage. And uh, basically, is your algorithm basically uh, filtering for cloud coverage and basically producing a variation that is net of climatic factor. Is that clear? Uh, I don't quite understand the question. Can you run that by me again? So the question is, uh, could the annual cycling that we see in the net and light be affected by climatic factors? Yeah, well, uh, you know, uh, the lights and the infrared emitters uh, can uh, be seen through optically thin clouds, but uh, the, the signal is diminished. Mm. And so we can make our best products uh, using cloud-free data. And uh, <clears throat> uh, we're fortunate that uh, VIRS is a meteorological instrument. And so uh, NOAA, produces a cloud product. And so that's what we rely on currently. Uh, we have a plan to develop our own cloud product and to tune it for detection of lights. And I'm hoping we get started on that uh, this year. And, uh, but it's clear that uh, uh, we, to really uh, get an accurate portrayal of the lights at the Earth's surface, you have to uh, pick data that is cloud-free to the best of our ability. And uh, so um, there, are, for almost the entire planet's surface, uh, you can make an, a nice cloud-free image if you have a year's worth of data. And for many parts of the world, you can do that in a single month. Uh, but if you look at our monthly products, there's there's always some gaps in areas that are uh, highly prone to cloud cover, such as Indonesia and <clears throat> Congo, uh, Brazil. So um, we, we do make the monthly products, but they, they end up with some gaps. Now, we record the location of those gaps in uh, a companion grid that tallies the number of cloud-free observations. And so if you look at that and see it drops down to zero or one or two, then you know that uh, you're looking at an area that has a gap in that particular month. Yeah, that, that's actually quite quite useful because when we are using the monthly data sets, 
we usually uh, basically uh, uh, run into that problem because for some months, you are going to see that there is actually no cloud-free observation that are available for a given pixel to, to be used. And uh, I was actually, uh, I mean, is it actually on your to-do list to, to, to switch from using optical uh, sensors to other type of sensors that are not that are not that sensible to, to cloud? I'm basically thinking of radars and this type of other type of sensors that are that are not using optical uh, is not they are not optical and therefore they are not uh, they are less vulnerable to to a cloud cover. Yeah, is yeah, that's a good strategy. Or, or not? Yeah, that's a good strategy. And radar is uh, an incredible um, data source. Uh, how there is a difference between the radar and nighttime lights because the radar is picking up on structures. And particularly if there are uh, right angles, you get a, a good reflection, uh, a nice strong return. Um, however, the nighttime lights are picking up on a human activity, that is the consumption of electricity. And so um, they don't necessarily show the same thing. And uh, so it, it makes sense to use multiple sources. And so uh, our nighttime lights uh, pick up on a particular phenomena that is lighting, primarily outdoor lighting, which is uh, the result of uh, mm -hmm. consumption of electric power. But there are other data sources that uh, can be blended in. Uh, some of them are not global. They're, they're, you're, it's like looking through a soda straw at the Earth's surface. But uh, there, there, there are um, radar systems that have relatively broad uh, swaths and many repeat coverages. And so I'd, I'd encourage anyone to, to use uh, multiple data sources. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Now there is another question. I'm not sure that I understand it, but maybe it will make sense for you. So I will just read it. So will the new products be corrected time series for the 2017 change in calibration methodology? Deep sea versus this deep space. Does it make sense to you? Do you do you get what uh, what the question is about? Oh yeah, I know what he's talking about. Uh, there was, uh, you know, for every instrument there is a noise floor, and so you want to uh, uh, put that noise floor down at the zero level, zero signal. But a a noise floor still has fluctuations. They're very small. Uh, but, uh, you, you know, it's just like the, uh, the electronic noise that's in a sen sensor and particularly if a low, if you have a low light imaging sensor, you've, the gain is kicked up a lot. So the, the gain on the day night band on VIRS is, uh, a million. So it does a million fold amplification. So, um, the earliest method for, uh, determining where the noise floor is, was done by looking at uh, deep ocean areas when with uh, zero moonlight. And uh, what was found was that you ended up with a lot of slightly negative radiances in the noise floor. And uh, uh, people were confused. What? How can you have a negative radiance? Uh, and so to uh, address that and uh, also to address some fluctuations that were seen because they redo these measurements once a month to make sure that, that they keep um, the, the noise floor placement current. And they shifted to, instead of looking at deep oceans when there's no moonlight, they look into the sky. And there's a way to rotate the sensor to look up at the sky and even things like look at the moon but uh, it was decided to switch to look at the sky, dark sky, to set the noise floor. Okay. And that resulted in a shift of 0.154, I believe, um, uh, radiances. And so it's way be below what we consider the noise floor for unlit conditions, which is one nanowatt. This is the, the uh, offset that was introduced 
was 0.154 radiance units. So it, for all, for most practical purposes, you could just ignore it. Uh, but uh, we we do uh, in our when we make our uh, long-term temporal nightly temporal profiles for lights, we embed that correction. And uh, so it's we know about it. We uh, back it out. But uh, it's kind of an interesting story. Mm -hmm. uh, and everybody that uses the data on a technical basis uh, would, would probably be interested in it and ought to know about it. Okay. Thank Mr. you very Hall. much. Uh, sorry, so Mr. Hall, maybe just um, another question. Uh, sorry, Claire. Um, more on the algorithm side. Uh, the, the purpose of this seminar is also to show that the satellite Im imagery is a way to estimate whether um, uh, consumption, uh, industrial activity, or economic activities in general. And I wanted to, out of curiosity, to know if there are countries which are really outliers in the sense that either there's a lot of uh, nightlight, but uh, for a number of reasons, it doesn't really correspond to economic activity or industrial activity. Or on the other hand, uh, little nightlight, but uh, way more uh, industrial activity. Uh, or in the more in more general terms, uh, uh, how do you set the or how do you estimate uh, economic activity like in a regression um, um, based on nightlight and what are the factors for correction? Oh yeah, well you know the the classic black hole is uh, North Korea, and uh, so they they have uh, you can compare North and South Korea, and it's it's uh, as they say night and day. Uh, that there are very few areas in North Korea that have lighting uh, it, that that actually propagates even to their industrial sites. So they have uh, one steel mill, and uh, it if you look at its temporal profile with our um, night fire product, you see that it has had very little activity, a, a very little steady activity, and uh, no activity for quite a long time. And that is in stark contrast with the level of activity at some of South Korea's steel mills. So that's the, the best example. There are, are other examples where uh, there is probably something similar, but perhaps not at the same scale going on. And so Afghanistan is one of those that has uh, very few lights and very little industrial activity. Another recent example is Ukraine. And so Ukraine has lost, uh, the vast majority of their lighting has been lost. Uh, the exceptions are uh, Crimea and parts of Russian occupied Eastern Ukraine where the lights have stayed on. And uh, uh, we haven't taken a look, but it's on our plan to look at the, some of the industrial sites in Ukraine and see if how the uh, the war has affected uh, the activity at industrial sites. So yeah, there are uh, countries that have anomalies. Some are chronic and some are uh, uh, recent. And uh, one of the interesting things that this data source makes it makes it possible to do is to track the recovery. And so I'm sure uh, that uh, when the war is over, Ukraine will have a chance to recover and we'll, we'll be able to watch the lighting return. So we only have 10 minutes left of question. Um, so. There is one more question. Um, how do you make local authorities understand the benefits of satellite imagery for identification and implementation of the project? I'm not sure this question is for you, Christopher. And maybe it's more for, Thomas and uh, AFD site, but maybe you have uh, some experience to share about uh, how to make local authorities buying your products or use the satellite imagery. So the um, the country. Uh, yeah, well, you know, uh, our specialty is making the products, and uh, occasionally we we uh, evaluate. Uh, whether we should continue making a particular product based on the number of downloads. And uh, 
So uh, if we made a product and we found that there were extremely small numbers of downloads, then we'd have to question, well, is this uh, uh, worth continuing? But uh, particularly the Nighttime Lights products, the monthly and annual products, those are, are downloaded a lot. Mm -hmm. And uh, so in 2021, there were 42,000 downloads and I think it was uh, 500 uh, terabytes of data downloaded. So uh, we do have a way to evaluate. Uh, now, in terms of outreach, there's only so much that we can do. And so I'm, I always try to pick, take opportunities such as the one I have today. Uh, but uh, uh, the, the bulk of our time is spent on uh, making the products, improving them, and publishing papers. Um, so we don't have a full-time staff that's working on uh, promoting the utilization of the products. We just uh, we know that they do get utilized, and we're happy to join if we're invited. But uh, there's there's not a lot of proactive uh, uh, effort to promote the use of the products. It, it, the best thing that we can do to promote the use is to make good products and to make them easy to, to uh, find and download. Okay, so maybe I can add something on uh, AFD side. We are promoting your products uh, by working with local authorities, local institutions. Uh, it's the case, for instance, in Senegal, uh, we are working with a local institution to work with satellite images on uh, estimated the rice yield um, and uh, also so, um, to code some algorithm and to, to learn with them how to, to adapt and uh, to improve the algorithm and the satellite images analysis um, to have a better estimation of rice yield and to be able to use it for also estimation of future production. Maybe, Thomas, you want to add something on... Um, Thomas? Yeah, maybe just a few comments. Uh, I'd say so far we've had more success in uh, or more interest from either local governments, uh, electricity companies, transportation companies, than from governments as a whole uh, themselves. So uh, the scale of the use of uh, satellite imagery has been mostly, as Claire mentioned, uh, at, uh, um, to study the evolution of a city or domestic transportation or urban planning, uh, also electricity in certain areas of a country rather than very global. Um, I, I'm not sure it's, uh, I would draw a rule out of it. It's more a personal observation and maybe a comment of what we've observed so far. But maybe we'll have requests from governments after this webinar. <laughs> Uh, okay, I think we still have four minutes and I will use those four minutes to ask some personal questions. So it's me actually hijacking the seminar for my own purposes. Sorry, guys. <laughs> um, so basically, Chris, one of the first questions that I had was, so you have been developing those, uh, uh, those new products for fire detection using gas flares, for instance. So what, the question is, is it actually possible to use uh, the product on fire detection to detect deforestation like uh, forest loss that is uh, due to, to wildfire or are the products only uh, does it, do that make sense only for for gas flares uh no they they're uh, actually uh, our fire product has uh, more information content than the standard fire product that you might get from NASA or NOAA, okay. uh, because we use multiple spectral bands, we can derive the temperature. Uh, their fire product doesn't have temperature. It's okay. actually a hot spot, so that you know that there's something hot in that pixel, but you don't have any a lot of other information. So we derive the temperature, we estimate the source size, and the heat output. Okay. And so there are a, a, a lot of, of biomass burning events that are picked up uh, it's it's not as widely utilized as uh, the uh, detections from gas flares and so uh, but it's there and we have a nice archive that goes back every night all the way back to 2012 
And so it's been slow to catch on with the biomass burning community, but um, it, I, I think it's uh, because it's, uh, it's not the primary product, fire product that comes from beers uh, that's uh, produced by NASA and NOAA. And so um, ours is sort of uh, uh, the, uh, the redheaded stepchild, if you will, of, of uh, global fire products. Good, and now a last question uh, is basically, so obviously you have seen many people use uh, your product to do a lot of things. Um, are there some, some misuses or some mistakes that people basically uh, uh, commit using your data set oh, yeah. that you actually want to address here? And uh, yeah. the question can also be like, okay, resolution wise, when people try to combine nighttime light data set with length cover data set to produce other type of product, do you recommend it? So basically, so what are the mistakes that people usually uh, make using your data set? And uh, are there mistakes that you want to basically to, to share here? Yeah, the most common and disastrous mistake that I'm aware of is uh, when uh, researchers take our nighttime lights product that it has had the outliers removed, uh, the outliers are the fires and ephemeral mm -hmm. events, and they take the outlier removed nighttime lights and they can see the nighttime lights. They say, oh, I can, I, I can uh, sum up the, the lighting for this administrative unit and uh, use that to track uh, uh, the electric power supply or the economic activity. And what they've forgotten is that there are there is residual uh, signal in the background and it's quite low, uh, but it's above zero. And uh, so for instance, if you did this for Afghanistan, uh, there is so much background and so few lights that when you look at the temporal profile of that uh, for the whole country of Afghanistan, it, the signal is dominated by the background, not, not the lights. And mm -hmm. so uh, we uh, recommend that uh, if you're studying lights, that uh, you would work with the version of our product where the background has been zeroed out. And uh, the other a uh, flaw in the way a lot of people use the data is they don't account for the change in the grid cell dimensions going from the equator to the pole. And so we use a equal angular a grid uh, that's uh, for mm -hmm. veers, it's 15 arc seconds. And so that's about a half kilometer on a side at the equator. But as you go to higher latitudes, uh, its its height stays the same, but its width narrows. And so there's a way to account for that. And so if you're comparing results from uh, two widely uh, spread latitudes and you didn't make that adjustment, uh, your results would be skewed. And so those are the, and you know, we've described those corrections in our papers, but some people uh, think that they, can simply download the data and uh, use it without these other considerations. They they end up with uh, either faulty results or results that they can't explain. So yeah, those are the two that come to mind most prominently. Okay, so just to react to to, to those uh, to those points that you you just raised. Um, so what about making available products that? Oh, that already take out the backgrounds. Uh, yeah, so, and uh, and adjust for, for for the variation across latitude of, um, of of the size of a pixel. So, I mean, you can you can also try to to meet people midway by by making product that that address those those type of mistakes. No. Well. Um... And I'm sure the, that there will be a lot. There will be a lot. Yeah, for our annual nighttime lights products, we uh, 
have a, we still provide access to the outlier removed, mm -hmm. but then we also provide access to the background removed. And uh, so uh, we'll go that far. Uh, we have a note at our download page that you can take the uh, lit grid cell mask from the annual product and apply it to the individual months and from that same year. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, people are still pretty much on their own when it comes to adjusting for the change in the grid cell size uh, as, mm -hmm. you, as the latitude mm -hmm. changes. Um, we, we, uh, sometimes people ask us, well, how can we do that? And we have uh, a grid that they can download if they want to apply that correction but we don't apply it to the, the data that's posted at our web page. Thanks a lot, Chris, for, I mean, for, for giving us uh, your time and for basically uh, agreeing to, to, to take part to, to this webinar. I mean, personally, I really found it fascinating. Um, Thomas, thank you a lot also for, for making time for, for this webinar. It was really great to, to have you and to, and to have your, your, your insight. Um, so, I mean, unfortunately, we are, we are at the end of, of our webinar. There are still a lot of questions that, uh, that are left unanswered, but please feel free basically to, to shoot your questions to, directly to, to, to Chris. Uh, his, web, uh, his, uh, his email address is available online, uh, so you can easily uh, find him. And you also have like a Twitter account of the uh, Earth Observation Group that you can use basically to, to reach out and to, to ask your questions. So, the, the intent of this webinar was to showcase the product developed at EOG. And I think that we basically managed to, to hit that goal. And uh, yeah, I can only just invite you to take it from here and uh, learn more about, about the product de developed by EOG. Reach out to, to Chris, uh, to some extent me, but I'm not, uh, I'm not the expert on, on, on that question, but I will try my best also to, to answer questions if there are. Um, and um, and spread the, the good word about uh, about Natam Light, uh, how useful they can be, and the limitation, and maybe other seminars will come to discuss. Okay, what are the pitfalls and uh, what to do to to use the Natam Light correctly and to avoid all the mistakes that uh, Christopher has just pointed out. So, Chris, thanks a lot again for for your time. Uh, Claire, you want uh, to add to those final words? No. Nope. Thank no. you also for all the participants. Yes, thank you for all the participants. Okay, so that's the end of our webinar. Thanks, you all. Uh, Chris, okay, Chris. Thanks, thanks See you later. Bye. See you later, Chris. Bye. Bye.